anyway, so I started doing soft goods a bunch of years ago because I wanted a backpack and I couldn't find what I, you know, one I liked, pretty common story. So I started making them. Yeah. Um, and I'm always kind of pretty interested in like, not just the result, but like getting the process right. And so someone offhand mentioned that in production, no one ever uses pins. And so from day one, I just never have used pins in any of my projects. Interesting. Which just means that like, you mess up a ton of stuff. Welcome to Collaborative with Spencer Krauss. This is a place for accomplished professionals to talk about their life and their work in an informal and hopefully an insightful way. If you like what you see, hit subscribe below. Enjoy the show. <laughs> Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Ariel Eisen. Ariel was on the Forbes 30 Under 30 list uh, when he was under 30, which I don't believe he is anymore, but he might still be. Uh, he started... Oh, son of a bitch. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he started a water filter company to make water filters for the developing world. Uh, he's worked on spacesuits, uh, really cool stuff. Ariel's one of the few people I know that actually knows how to make soft goods. So anything sewed together, uh, like a backpack or a seat belt, or uh, in some cases, articles of clothing, um, got a pretty good range of lightweight bike packing gear. Uh, and recently, I know you uh, you got that CNC machine uh, behind you put to work making some buckles uh, that are pretty high end. So um, yeah, I'm sure I missed something. But Ariel, welcome to the pod. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Um, yeah, now you got a got a bunch of it there. Um, yeah, excited to jump in. Cool. Yeah, I think I uh, last time. So this is our second re time recording this because we had a couple of issues before. Last time, I think I, I remember to mention the stuff you did during the pandemic, but I forgot the spacesuits. So. <laughs> <laughs> so we flopped. Well, I'm sure we'll get to a bunch of stuff doing uh, this. So. Awesome. So I feel like uh, so, often on these podcasts, you know, the more detail you get into, the, the more fun it is. Sometimes people just stick to high level general information you're like yeah okay yeah well and there's some people that come on where they don't really want to talk about stuff because they're a little bit afraid and what i tell everyone that comes on here is look if there's anything you don't want released just let's yeah. just edit it out and then you don't feel like right. you know your butthole's clenched during the recording yeah like, oh, i i think sometimes the hard line to walk is like the more detail you give the the sort of narrower the the audience potentially is who wants to sit through 45 <laughs> minutes of like discussing work offsets on a cnc or whatever but, i mean I, I have three hour episodes where i'm talking about everything from you know like electrostatic discharge protection to like politics at different companies to like what it's like to get carjacked in jersey city <laughs> <laughs> all right so yeah but I, I'm, I mean, our, our viewer base isn't great right now. So, I mean, that might be partly my fault for letting that happen. Till now. No. <laughs> Till now. <laughs> yeah. Well, you are better at getting PR than I've always been. So my hope is this is going to turn this podcast all the way around to have you on here. And this will be like our big break. <laughs> I don't know about that. We'll find out, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So I guess I, I sort of asked a question earlier and I wanted to get into your answer and because we're having those technical issues. I, I didn't get to hear it as much as I wanted to, but I'll, I'll jump back in. So you and I met at school originally. And um, one of the things that I think we sort of bonded over is that we both were kind of of the school of thought that, you know, it's better to prototype than to spend a lot of time in design and just get through, you know, into a project. And I feel like now that, you know, because I mean, we, we probably talk at least, you know, once a month, a lot of times more than that, even though we're on other sides of the country. And, um, Basically, uh, me in Pittsburgh, you in, in Seattle or Kingston, right near Seattle in Washington. And um, I, uh, I feel like we've both kind of changed our, our tune a little bit. So like I've kind of gotten more steeped in, you know, design, engineering, management and kind of traditional old school stuff. And I feel like you have, too, but maybe for different reasons or through different experience. So. I guess, what do you find your sweet spot is there uh, these days? And I don't know, like, what are the advantages of like working with your hands yeah. versus designing and vice versa? I mean, I definitely agree with, uh, you know, a few, a few parts to the question there. So um, I think in terms of like a bias toward actually making things rather than talking about making things, 
uh, definitely agree on that front. Um, you know, especially when you're working in R and D in a, in a, maybe a new field or a, a new product release. Um, you know, I think it's different if, it, if it's like, we are a company that makes table saws and this is our whatever 40th version. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like, you know exactly what's what's um, what's needed and what you want to add and so on and so forth. I mean, even there, though, some companies that have like super legacy products, um, I feel like sometimes just get become obsolete because they forget to go talk to their customers. Um, yeah. And be like, how can we make this better? How can we push the envelope? But I mean, I have a funny story. So when I was working on uh, the water filtration stuff, um, we developed a pretty awesome product. We thought uh, it was yeah, I liked it. a water filter that was um, it was like a thousand times more efficient to move than bottled water, which is sort of the sort of the status quo for disaster relief often like a cue like right after the disaster they'll hand out bottled water it's heavy it's bulky um expensive to move so this was you know a thousand times more efficient to move um a hundred times cheaper so on and so forth um, and that's just and based on the out, amount of mass to like the amount of water you can get yeah, out of the sucker you could really okay. pack it onto a truck all this stuff um it's cool and it was a, a little personal water filter and we were like this is going to be amazing so we finally got our you know got off of the drawing board, we had some prototypes. We'd been prototyping the whole time, but we weren't really talking to customers, But um, which was the mistake. And so we went to a conference and showed it to like Oxfam, Red Cross, so on and so forth. And um, turns out that everyone does uh, delivers aid by family, not by individual. Interesting. And so they were just like, you know, we don't really use personal water filters and even no. though there's like hygiene reasons to do it and so on and so forth like all of our planning and all of the good thoughts that went into it i feel like often you get caught up in this idea of like i can't really show this yet because i haven't solved all the problems i know exist but the danger there is the deeper you go i mean two things one the cost of making changes as you go through a project increase kind of exponentially <laughs> and the second is that you might have just missed some like really fundamental things, you know, some assumptions you have built in that you don't really realize. I've been there but... so many times. <laughs> yeah, and then like, you know, I gotta, gotta keep a it a secret. Startup. Nobody can know about this idea. <laughs> right, like we need to make it lighter and we're working on like getting a machined titanium chassis or whatever, so on and so forth. <laughs> right, I, I worked with a, with a startup that was trying to make I mean, I don't want to go into, can't go into too much detail, but basically it was trying to make a product that went on your feet, that did a few things. And they originally wanted me to figure out how to like make a, a chassis for this. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, so I shouldn't, uh, oh, your client. No, no, it is a shoe. I mean, it goes on your foot, right? So, <laughs> um, but they wanted to make a chassis that was below a certain weight. I forget what weight they specified. And they were like, you know, you have experience with composites and machining. Like, what what do you think we can do? And I was kind of like, my first question was just, you know, where, like, how did you come up with this threshold you're trying to hit? And they're like, oh, it just seems like, a, you know, that's pretty light. Oh, Jesus. And I, was like, and I was like, okay, so like we can spend tens of thousands of dollars developing, like no doubt what you're asking for is achievable. But maybe you'd be better off just like cutting it out of a block of wood and paint it a nice color and maybe glue on some motors and stuff, bring some users in and be like, hey, this is a fully functional prototype, but we're having some bug, but seeing as we're here, like we may as well use this time. Can you just strap these to your feet and like walk up and down some stairs? Yeah. Right. And suddenly in like two or three, you know, whatever, two or three days or like a week or whatever, you can build something that looks like the thing works and actually get a real test of what does the customer want? Cause it might turn out that you painted it green and they're like, why is it green? I wish it was blue. Yeah. And so you can work out a lot of those. One, if you, yeah, yeah. If you, if you spent money on like anodizing or, you know, powder yeah, coat of course or this is process so or... much easier to see when you're like talking about someone else's product. Oh project, yeah. Like, Oh, you yeah. goof like come on now <laughs> like you gotta go talk to people but of course when it's your own thing you're just like oh man it's not ready yet all this it's stuff. so genius i could spend another 10 grand just getting it ready 
Yeah, <laughs> I, I know I have so many more examples of me. Well, so I, that mistake. I had that product I wanted to create, you know, like about a couple months ago. I don't know, or maybe it was more yeah. than that. But I remember thinking of myself like Captain Ahab from Moby Dick. Like, why am I doing this? Like, I'm just chasing my tail. I'm making mistakes I would advise my customers against. Like I'm doing all kinds of stupid shit because I'm emotionally invested. Yeah. yeah, so that's one. I, on the question of like hands-on versus like um, maybe being more like managing or engineering, um, I would say what set me apart on an engineering front is definitely my hands-on experience. So I don't know and depending on the prod project, I'm doing different things. So for example, I was brought in on an aerospace project to do an installation on an aircraft of a system someone else had already designed and partially fabricated. Yeah, um, partially fabricated. And we got there, we started installing it, and I put in the first servo and assembly. Um, and I noticed there was just a lot of backlash that was inherent in how they had tied it into the aircraft. Makes sense. And so I called the head of their engineering effort and I just said like, hey, like what, what tolerance do you have for backlash in this system? And they were like, basically none. And I was like, okay, so like back to the drawing board. Yeah, you're out of spec already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was tying into a part that we looked it up in the manual for the aircraft, and there was a specified amount of play in that joint. Oh, so no, if no. You touched the bolts, you had to send the aircraft back to the manufacturer to re, like, rework the whole thing. Holy so crap. Like, <laughs> yeah. Is that just there common no in aircraft? Like, I feel like that kind of thing is maybe... I, so is that just common in aircraft design, like that sort of finickiness? Because I feel like... I don't, yeah, this was on a helicopter, so I don't actually know, um, and I was brought in to it, like, I don't know a ton about aircraft. It's all good. I was mostly brought into it for the hands-on stuff. I don't think it's super uncommon for there to be, I mean, I know it's- Well, just like rivets are, are a thing, for instance, right? And then, I mean- Yeah, and there's a manual for exactly how to set a rivet and what your pattern needs to be and so on and so forth. Like. Aviation in general, the reason it's so safe is because of all those standards. So yeah. it's not something you're going to be like, yeah, we'll just ignore it. The other thing is... We'll just torque it down to T for tight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the other piece that's uh, very relevant is that um, to fly it easily, um, and, and don't quote me on this, again, this is not my area of expertise, but basically... I've kind of worked on aircraft is, in a similar capacity. <laughs> it needs to be registered as an experimental aircraft. Oh, cool. If it started off as being a non-experimental, um, you need to basically work with someone from the FAA to be like, hey, here are the changes we made. This is why we made the changes. And then it's up to their discretion to say, yeah, you're good. Or like, you can't this, fly that. This is kind of messed up. And so things to consider are like how much it moved the CG from the original CG of the aircraft. Center of gravity. Uh, yeah. Um, and so anyway, it was a bit of a mess. So the point is I was brought in because of my hands-on skills. But in the end, we, en we ended up redesigning the whole system and actually we were uh the running joke was that we were doing cad because we built the whole thing in cardboard in the in the aircraft because there were so many moving parts <laughs> so yeah you could hire a team to get the whole thing captured in in actual cad but so a cardboard aided design was the joke <laughs> um anyway it, it was super useful and we just made it all move so you could see the clearance between different parts through the whole range of motion of all the controls and everything nice um so yeah, I ended up doing a bunch of design work on that. Um, but actually knowing how things are made and and understanding like how do you fold sheet metal so you can design means you can design sheet metal parts that can actually be made on a normal press break or on a box break. You know, like what are the tools at hand? Can we change the design a little bit so you don't need some specialized piece of equipment? Or you don't need to design like custom fingers for a press break that let your part, you know, it's yeah, very easy to silly do, stuff to back yourself into a corner on, in sheet metal um, where it's no longer really fabricatable, fabricable, fabricable. Um, <laughs> uh, at this point, I guess like I, I think what I like 
in general, like what keeps me really interested in life, I guess, is learning. Um, yeah, which same. sounds kind of dumb, but but it's not that dumb. Um, so I, I love like learning new processes, but at some point, like once you're good at the actual doing, like some suddenly like the managing of the process becomes really interesting. Like how do you efficiently manage that, or how do you? Um, you know, like right now I'm doing this uh, product, which I can talk about at some point, but- um, The buckles. Yeah, the buckles. And yeah. so there's a, you know, for the past, I don't know, six months, I've been really um, deep in, you know, the tool paths and fixturing and all that stuff and how to efficiently uh, produce them on the CNC, so on and so forth. And that part is, I mean, by no means is it done. Like there's always room for improvement for sure. Sure. But- now I'm working on um, like Kanbaning the whole shop. Like I, I like Kanban cards for ordering. Yeah. Nice. Load chart of the whole process and what, you know, what the precursor materials are, what the consumables are for every step and make sure that everything is Kanban and everything. Can you explain is, uh, you Kanban know. cards? Like the way you explained them to me like a, a year or yeah. two ago when I yeah. converted so, our whole shop. Yeah, Sorry, I should um, say before I converted after hearing you explain it. <laughs> so basically, um, a few things. One, uh, so lean manufacturing is the sort of the umbrella um, or lean, whatever. Um, and the idea behind it is eliminating waste. Um, and so there's a great book called The Toyota Production Method. It's pretty short, um, but it basically is the guy at Toyota who started um, all of lean is, uh, for, from my understanding, is it sort of grew out of the way Toyota approaches their production, yeah. um, which is really counterintuitive to, or, or opposite to sort of what you learn, I feel like, or what I knew about mass manufacturing and kind of what the goals were, were with mass manufacturing. It's like set up a tool with a process that's making a part and just crank out like 10,000 of them. And that's what I sort of thought of in terms of mass manufacturing. Yeah, I, it turns I probably out still Toyota do. Toyota does exactly the opposite. So instead of like when they were punching out um, body panels, and there's probably p people listening to this who know a lot more about lean than I do. So send all hate mail to podcast. I have a bunch of questions for you, so please reach out to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's, uh, there's some very specific questions that I can actually get to. But anyway, so the idea here is a few things. One is to reduce the batch size as much as possible. So you're really producing like one of something at a time and you take that one piece and get it all the way through your process, every step of the process, because that is the quickest way to get raw material um, to a point where you're, where you've added all the value to it. So you can sell it to the customer, which is the point of your business, presumably. Um, and that's the old way of doing it. Like that is not Toyota. Yeah, so the old way would just be like make ten thousand in step one, or yeah. take a smaller example. If you're running a drill this hole shop, ten thousand times, or sorry, yeah, just have one person drilling one hole, and then you move that batch of stuff that has that new hole over to the station where one guy is just tapping that hole. And yeah, and once he's tapped all the holes, they move it to the next station. Um, so this, you might have a person at each station, but this, you would take one piece, drill that hole and pass it to the next station where they tap the hole immediately. Um, so it's not exactly counter to like Henry Ford, the assembly process there, but the big difference that gets to the Kanban cards, which you had sort of asked about, um, or that we were talking about, yeah, um, absolutely. is so one is sort of a push method. So say you have a really fast machine. Um, sort of if you think about your production as like top down, like you have raw materials and then they go through your process and they're at the bottom. So push would be of a really fast machine up here and it's pumping out whatever little piece and you can make 10,000 in a day. And so it is. And so at the end of the day, you have a huge amount of that one piece, but it turns out you have some slower operations um, later. Yeah. And so what you do is you pop those 10,000 in a bin and then you take them and you store them. And throughout the next week or two, you work your way through um, the other steps involved in making that 10,000 pieces into a sellable product. That's sort of a push idea. So you're overproducing at the beginning of your process because you have a really fast machine. But then later on, you're not converting that to something you can sell anyway. And in storing all that stuff, you have a ton of wasted motion in like, 
You have employees packing that into shelves where they're going to be stored. You have maybe a lot more storage facilities that you need to maintain. Then when you go to get your parts out of that storage facility, they might be rusty. And so then you have to rework them, which is, you know, more uh, wasted. Effort. Yeah. Um, and well, you so could lose something. Way, <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the Kanban card is a very, very simple way of making it a pull system. So when you sell a product out of your warehouse, say you had 10 of them, now you have nine. That might trigger, you might have a Kanban card sitting there. So when the so there's a physical that, like index card. Yeah, there's a physical index card that says like minimum quantity 10, minimum uh, production, say 50 or whatever. So that's going to trigger production. Maximum so production 50. Um, yeah, it depends. Okay. Uh, how I mean, the implementation is kind of up to the user. And this is where really where the questions for me begin, because it's like, ideal is to have single piece flow. So meaning you're only making one of everything all the way through the chain as they're being used. So the ideal would be you literally order one piece of aluminum. In my case, that comes in, I machine it into a buckle. I paint that buckle. I assemble that, that aerospace buckle, aluminum? I sell that buckle. <laughs> what? I so said, is that aerospace aluminum? <laughs> oh, it's oh, you know it. 6061? 6061, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it works well, but, um, nice. anyway, so Kanban, yeah, so you have all these index cards around on every supply on every piece of material, or I have a Kanban card on my rubber gloves that I need to do my painting. I have Kanban cards on the grit, um, this, the blasting media that goes in the sandblaster. So I never run out, but I also don't need so, to pay someone to manage that process. Yeah. And the way you explained it to me, which was kind of cool is say you don't want to get down past like two cans of spray can in inventory. So the last can has a card in front of it that you'll expose when you pull that second to last can out. So you'll order more. Yeah, exactly. And, and suddenly, like, I've just been implementing it over the past couple of weeks. And already, like, I can just feel my mental load diminishing, because I just know it's handled. So I don't yeah. have to like, go, Oh, shit, like at the end of the day, oh, man, do we need more fasteners? Like, do we need more media? Am I running out of anything? Or even worse than that, is you come in to run a machine, and you realize you're out of material, which I also did. Um, yeah, I've been there. And it's not super uncommon, unless you're super vigilant and walking around and checking everything. But that's all wasted time and wasted energy. So it's pretty cool. And it takes you out of commission for, I mean, as long as it takes to get new material shipped yeah. to you. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the, the other thing is like, there's, uh, and these have their place for sure, but there's like shop management software that does all this stuff. This is like you. an ERP. Yeah. The thing is with those systems, like you only get out what you put in. And sometimes there's this like weird middle ground where like, if you don't, fully rely on the ERP, you it's sort of hard to get any value out of it. And then if you forget to update it, it fails you, so on and so forth. So it sometimes adds a layer of, and what I've seen is a lot of those systems really work well if there's someone whose job it is to manage that, but that means you're hiring someone to manage that. Yeah. And so- That's a lot of money. Tough. So the Kanban cards I've just found to be really simple. They're sweet. Um, I mean, we use them because of you. <laughs> yeah, and, and if and if you use them on most of your stuff and you are in the middle of implementing, like that's okay too, and it's still helpful. And it's not like oh, now we're halfway between like an ERP and something else. And lately, what I've been doing, which is awesome, and I you might already be doing this, but there's tools online for free that let you build a QR code and you can type an email into it. So that brother printer that I think we both got has that built into the software that comes with it. Is what? You can make a QR code with data encoded awesome. in. And so I, I did not know that. I got, <laughs> so, well, now you know. And if you don't know, yeah. now you know. <laughs> so and it will write emails. So, so what I did recently- So I, I just put big master part numbers in there so I can like highlight the bar and then just reorder by clicking the Honeywell oh, reader. Nice. Yeah, so that's great for McMaster, but I found I'm working with some suppliers that only like it's a quote system by email. Oh, I see. And you can actually create. So when you scan the QR code, it will open your email with a pre-populated email. That's built cool. Into the QR code. And then you just hit send. And so for all my aluminum, for example, I have 
like basically request for quote on the QR code on the Kanban card. So when I take out a piece of aluminum and expose the Kanban card, and maybe it has a week worth of aluminum behind the Kanban card, because that's the lead time from the supplier. Neat. Is, is the, now, is there like a safety margin you use there, or do you just go with kind of bare lead time? I do. So I actually have about 10 days of aluminum nice. behind the Kanban card, because depending when you order in the week, you might miss... They deliver out near where I'm at on Tuesdays, which is yeah. a random fact that no one really cares to know. But um, well, so I mean, if I order, if I order Monday me. or, or a, say I order like, I don't know, Thursday or Friday, and at this point, like sometimes I do, and by sometimes I mean most of the time, <laughs> the weekend, um, you know, I can all, yeah, I can basically run out. So yeah, I, I keep 10 days. So my minimum stock is 10 days of production. Um, and so that's easy math to do and you just write a minimum, but basically then I just scan the QR code on my phone. It pops up my email app with an email pre-written and I just hit send. And that's a request from my rep to give me a quote on that material. Which means you have a second action item to follow up on the quote and place the order. Yeah, but at Got least it. it's incoming. So as long yeah. as, yeah, I did toy with the idea of putting my credit card on file which I probably will do down the road, but it's I, I'm still sort of figuring out how their pricing works because I've noticed that if they basically do it by the pound, so the bigger the bigger your order is, the more pounds of total material you order, not each line item, but the total Interesting. really has an effect on the price. So I just, at this point, still want to see the number because if it's yeah. higher, I just want to call them and under... Like the, the other day, it turned out that I was at like 90 pounds on my order, and there's a much bigger price break if you're over 100 pounds. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. It's that kind of thing, right? Like, still want to have a finger on it, but at some point I'll probably switch over. Because the part that I think is, like, it's easy to see where your money is being wasted when I'm ordering aluminum and I could have gotten it for, you know, I could have saved whatever, 100 bucks on the material. But I think what's a little bit more insidious in terms of waste and what you don't see is like how much time you're putting into saving that hundred dollars. <laughs> so it might just be totally like a like kind of <laughs> foolish of me to not just place the order and like what? So I wasted forty dollars, but all in, I didn't take the time to stop my day to like I don't know. So anyway, no, no, no. I mean that's that's a question all of us face. I think that are are in business, right? And like you wonder. Yeah. You know, my, yeah, and it's always funny when you're working on your own projects internally, you'll like goof around on the internet looking for like, oh man, I'm not paying $120 for that one piece. <laughs> and then you find it for like $35 and you're like, yeah, what a win. And you hell spend, yeah, like two hours. Or like you get one on eBay and there's like a horrible blemish on it or just some defect that makes it unusable. And now you're reworking that part. <laughs> right. And then the second you're billing hourly, it's just it like would not be economical at all <laughs> you just added like whatever your hourly two is hours that. yeah 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 <laughs> yeah um so that's always funny the questions i have around lean right now which i you know if anyone has more information on how to think about this so one really interesting part is as you increase the size of, so the rationale to what's the best way to get a hold of you if somebody actually wants to follow up on this oh good question um well, I'm on Instagram as austere underscore manufacturing. Nice. Um, so that's one way. You can also uh, shoot me an email at I'm trying to think what email I want to give out. <laughs> um, oh, I have a website, urieleisen.com, I think. Um, nice. Or just search. Yeah. And there's a contact me there. Yeah. Um, anyway, so so the, the rationale behind a huge batch size is that say you're say like there's some setup time to get the machine ready to run that part you basically get to amortize all of that time over hundreds or thousands of parts yeah okay and so that makes a lot of sense where you're like oh wow once i'm cranking i can really just rip through these and then the issues with big batches are if you mess anything up you just mess a lot of them up in the same way yeah. Whereas if you take it fully through the process, and maybe you don't anything. figure out to like unit ten thousand that you fucked exactly. up. Exactly. So that's one <laughs> one issue with it. Um, and then the other issue is that you're because you're amortizing the waste over many parts, it's still waste. 
right? And so, but you didn't put in a lot of effort into just eliminating that waste to begin with. Interesting. And so a lot of the, a lot of it is like, if you do single piece flow of like only make one at a time is the ideal, but I know people deviate from that quite a bit. Yeah, I'm sort of sense. curious exactly what thinking goes into setting those minimums, right? Yeah. So if single piece flow is the ideal, what are the reasons you would back off of single piece? Flow? To like 20 piece flow. <clears throat> right, like maybe, maybe your fixture holds 20 pieces or in my case, I have these fixtures that make one of the part of the buckle. Oh, cool. Um, so there's the tombstone goes on the fourth axis. That this ass. makes eight pieces. Um, so that's not single piece. Can we get a better fact, look at I, that? Like I, I'd be interested in kind of. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So this is it here. Oh, so it's making this piece. Cool. Um, small... If you could hold it a little bit over, I just, uh, it's just out that's of frame right. uh, the other way. This yeah, one. you got it a little bit, a little bit more. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think that's good. I, I just can't see the full tombstone, but I could, yeah, yeah, that's I'll perfect. I'll show you that in a sec. So this is the piece oh. that I'm making. Uh, that's a completed through. one? This nice. Completed that's awesome. Um, and so that, it's this cam piece inside that I'm making. That is very so smooth. Do you have to lubricate one. those, or do those just work like that out of... Um, no, the coating I'm using has pretty decent lubricity. Nice. And then it has a titanium pin, so it's not aluminum on aluminum. It's a grade two. You end up with, with galling. What's up? Is it a grade two, grade five? Like what? What type of titanium? Uh, I don't remember. Nah, that's it's all good. It's a McMaster special, I think. <laughs> um, no, it's I, I forget. Um, it's all good. Yeah, I should know. It's 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 space grade, so don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, um, weasel word if I ever heard one. <laughs> anyway, so this is the tombstone, and basically it holds um, eight pieces in op one and then these pieces get flipped over into these cavities oh cool uh, down here yeah so two oppose each other there and then two more there and then on the other side you have two more so four more pieces there it's awesome um, so that's that's the tombstone so this is eight piece flow um and this is nice because it gets me a longer walk away time from the cnc when i'm running those yeah which um, means you can do something you know useful with that time yeah, such as loading the other tombstone. So here's the other one that makes the body. So this is all loaded up and ready to rock. Nice. Um, this holds, and then this is a zero point system. So every time you drop it in the CNC, it locates back to the same place as you machined it. That's cool. So you it's it's like a thirty second um, chip to chip. Like you open the door, change out the tombstones, and hit go again. Um, change the program number, hopefully. Um, <laughs> Anyway, but, you know, when I have issues with whatever and I've had, you know, a bad tool that chipped or something, like you scrap eight parts, right? So Yuck. it's like easy to get caught up in um, making tons of stuff and you go like, wow, on a good day, we can like bang out 500 parts. But it turns out if you actually look at your day-to-day -day production on average it's like kind of garbage because you have all these rejects and when you reject you're scrapping a lot of good material and all this but and wasting like time piece, too like, how do you think about one piece flow as the ideal but then actually running not one piece flow so like that's one yeah because well, it's puzzling over that's interesting to me because it does seem like in general like when you talk about ideals or different ideologies i mean it's just that you know it's like the end of a spectrum that you're never actually going to get to Right, it's like uh, theory and and practice are the same in theory. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, so that's kind of been an interesting challenge, and the main one is when I'm spraying the paint. So when I'm doing paint, you mix a batch of paint up, and then you're pouring it into your gun, and then you're spraying, and you can spray one piece or you can spray a hundred pieces. And then when you're done with that color, you need to clean the whole gun. Oh, that's a lot of setup time. Yeah. And so I'm just like, shit. Okay. So you're, if you're telling me that the idea is for me to do one at a time, <laughs> am I just missing something? Or in actual practice, people do with paint move away from that? Or do I need to figure out and spend like five days coming up with a way to reduce that color change time down to 
whatever, you know, 50 seconds, 20 seconds. Like, I don't know what it can be. Like, maybe I need to design a system that I drop in the cap that just pumps acetone through it yeah, and filters that acetone so it can recirculate it a good amount. Like, That'd be cool. Like, Cause they're right. Like that might work. Yeah. And then, and then if that did work and I could really just paint two and it was as easy. So anyway, so these are all the puzzles that I'm trying to actually figure out in terms of like implementing lean for real. Um, my sense is that relying on your gut is not the move because I think we have a tendency to not analyze information very well. Yeah, right? that would like, be very Japanese of us. Yeah, like <laughs> I'm just joking. You really have to look at your total production, not yeah. just like, wow, when this process is running, boy, does it run. It's like, yeah. yes, but all these other factors. So I don't know. It's, that makes it's sense. pretty interesting to think about. And I highly recommend the it's... book. If that book was written by like Joe Schmo, who's done whatever, you'd be like, yeah, like, I don't know <laughs> if I'm going to do that. <laughs> but it's written by Toyota and that's how they operate. So for example, which I found really kind of crazy is like when on their assembly line they don't run like a station wagon in the morning and do a bunch of that and then their camry like a sedan in the afternoon yeah they will run one station wagon and then one camry and then just based on what got ordered and what order or what they need to p fulfill no, I think the idea is that all supply chains are constantly flowing yeah. at a set appropriate level yeah so there's never like, so ideally, if you know you need to produce X number of this item per month, yep. instead of taking care of all that production at the beginning of the month, just bang out the station wagons, is you just produce this many every day, maybe three a day. And then it means that the whole supply chain of all the pieces that go into that assembly, that whole supply chain is moving at the appropriate rate. Like goods are coming in at the appropriate rate and everything. And one really interesting way of thinking about that is like if you order $10,000 of materials because you know you're going to use them and you get a discount, um, but you use them over the course of three months, one question to ask is like if you only ordered $500 or $200 of materials this week, how else could you de like is that the best way of deploying those dollars this week oh interesting you know what i mean like instead maybe i should not take the discount only spend a hundred bucks and then take two hundred dollars and spend it on advertising because i know what my returns are in terms of sales on advertising so that's that has been kind of helpful for me to recalibrate because I think I was too focused, and I think a lot of people. Well, yeah, I mean, I've fallen victim to that too, right? You're like, oh, I got a sweet deal. I've got yeah, man, more material than I'm going to use in like, 10 years. Right. And I think part of that is like if you do have a chunk of cash, so you're not fully deploying all your money, then you're kind of like, oh, well, you know, what's the difference? Like, but if that's like either, like, I guess either you just, come clean with yourself that you're just making bad decisions <laughs> yeah. or you rethink how you're using your cash. Cause like, I know, for example, I just ran this, um, uh, marketing is amazing bike, by the way, bikepacking.com like, uh, 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 reached out about these buckles and wanted to run a piece and, um, ended nice. up working with me on, on making a piece. It was That's awesome. awesome. Um, they're really cool. If you're into bikepacking, check them out. Bikepacking.com. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, and I'd been using, like, going on that website for years, uh, finding, like, cool routes and all sorts of stuff. But, Badass. Yeah, and that had a huge effect on um, just, like, exposure. It was really helpful um, just to get the name out because we just got this up and running. So, <laughs> not many people know we exist. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I saw what effect that had. So, at this point, I kind of know, like, okay, what if I paid a uh you know a reporter to do a story or paid an influencer like at this point i actually have some metrics on what the returns might be from that yeah and i think so rather than ordering you know ten thousand dollars of really cheap aluminum that's going to last me six months or two months or whatever you know maybe take some of that money put it into marketing and then later as i see those returns like 
you know, the whole thing is just kind of flowing instead of marketing is an interesting one. I feel like, because it's very easy to overlook as like a young engineer, you know, when you're just like, well, why the fuck do I need that? And you're like, well, Oh, cause all business stems from that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People need to know you exist. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, no, that's, that's one where I think when SK was first around, uh, we definitely underspent on marketing. And um, we're sort of finding a balance now, but it's, I mean, there's also a lot of charlatans in that field because, I mean, you know, strategic, you know, smart marketing is such a thing of beauty. I mean, it's no wonder that people are trying to fake it. Yeah. And like getting like one thing is people knowing you exist. The other is people who want Correct. to buy things from you know you exist. hundred percent. Yeah. And I, I've so... definitely hired people that have been like, well, look how many more people there are. Like right, how many like, of those are serious customers? <laughs> like, right, right. What's and your conversion I rate? I'm wading through all the ones who are just students. Not, yeah, students or whatever. Like yeah. they're not bad people necessarily. No, 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 no. But they're not placing large orders. And I mean, right. for the money you spent acquiring that contact, you're probably not going to see a return. Like we were giving yeah. away um, power tools and drones at competitions last year. Uh, and yeah. like trade events and okay. a lot of those went to just, you know, like students or whoever. And you're just like, right, no, God damn sweet. It. yeah, exactly. And, and just like, you're like, I want to be fair. And so I'm going to use this random number generator. And like, I'm yeah. not going to be one of those people that just gives it to like, what seems like a high value prospect. And then okay. you're like, ah, why am I wasting all this money? You know? And so yeah, I think at one event, I mean, you know, we gave away like a $200 power tool set. And we got 10 contacts, so our cost for contact, non-sales qualified was $20 a contact. It was really bad. Right. So it's just like, why are we yeah, doing it's a, this? It's a tough balance. I'm definitely at the beginning of figuring that out. Um, till now, I've mostly been doing straight like R&D for other people. And so um, now I'm actually doing a consumer good. Um, so definitely have a lot to learn there nice yeah yeah and no, i feel like every uh every new endeavor like you you learn so much and um yeah. i think i told you about the time i went to an older mentor uh the one that starts with a d and yeah. i i said something on the lines of like i made all these rookie mistakes on this project i feel like an idiot you know like when will i stop making these mistakes and you know this person's like in their 50s or 60s and they said the day I stop making the day I stop making mistakes is the day I quit R and D. Yeah, for sure. Like, All right, yeah, I mean, makes me feel better yeah. about myself. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. No, I, I, I definitely. I mean, I, I think like you have to be willing. I, I the, the the issue is, I guess, quite, you know, sort of stating it as a failure. I I think if you approach prototyping as like hypothesis testing it's like disproving a hypothesis is really valuable you were always pretty good at that though i feel like like even like you know five to seven years ago like you were you were pretty good at looking at it that way yeah i try i try to i mean i i definitely feel like what has ended up getting me a lot of my work is the fact that I've messed up a bunch of times. And so you can very honestly have a conversation with someone and just be like, hey, here's what goes into making something like this. So you can totally do it. Here are the issues you're gonna have and here's what you have to work through. This is kind of the road path. Like this is kind of the, the roadmap. I did it, right? Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, okay, either I can do that if I wanna go through it or I can just hire you because you're already <laughs> through that. <laughs> yeah, totally. and i don't feel like that you know so i just feel like there's a huge amount of value in actually having made all those mistakes. no i i agree i mean and you know like every new but project i do makes me more like... valuable as, an, as a professional and right you know there's it definitely though is easy to uh get a little uh beat down <laughs> if you put a huge amount of effort into something that doesn't pan out oh, for sure so, yeah. my dad my dad even said to me like when i was starting kind of down this road he's like when are you going to specialize? That's when you'll start making real money. <laughs> like like yeah, making a boat every true. day or making, what's that? I think that's true to an extent. Yeah. Um, I think the scope of specialty can be pretty broad though. That's right? a good it doesn't point. It doesn't need to be like, I make 
shoe polishing devices. You know, it can just be more like, I think even like integrating mechanical and electrical stuff. I mean, at this point, maybe that's not quite specialized enough. Yeah, mechatronics, I mean, I look at those people as generalists, but some of them are pretty damn smart when it comes to how to do that. And so it's like, okay, those guys are probably specialists. And so, right. Which means um, I'm shitting on generalists, which is not right. <laughs> shouldn't, shouldn't, because I am I one. Know. Shouldn't I, be doing it. You know, they're, they're generally pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the person. I mean, there's so many charlatans. And I mean, I've certainly been guilty of trying to blow up my, you know, qualifications especially when i was like in school and i was trying to you know get the yeah. credit for a little more get experience than i had yeah exactly but yeah. i mean i don't know like at this point like i'm just like ah, life is too short to be lying to people yeah. or you know manipulating the facts because i mean i don't know just get there <laughs> the hard way and the long way and i'll be better at it yeah. and actually qualified and i'll feel better about myself People can detect when you uh, are full of crap, right? I mean, it's it's pretty. Like, I mean, you can do it. I can do it. You know, it's we talked about this. Like the salesperson that tries to sell you the highest price thing in your price range every single time, regardless of what you actually need. I there's a salesperson in my life right now who I <laughs> I've definitely ranted to you about this off this podcast. But yep, I don't know who you're talking about. It would be so much more effective to just be like, here's what I know, here's what I don't know. <laughs> and here's the information you're asking for, and I recommend you talk to these people to figure out those questions. Yeah. And I'd be like, at least you're honest. I like, trust you. You don't need to be knowledgeable. I trust you're going to tell me what you know and what you don't. Yeah. I would always much rather work with someone like that than someone who's trying to bullshit me. And you find out very quickly if somebody is <laughs> yeah, full of shit. Yeah, you're just like, wait, what? You told me this thing, and they're like, oh, sorry, yeah, that wasn't... I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. No, I mean, you and I were on a project together recently where we dealt with a vendor that was acting that way and they lasted about one job. <laughs> right. And then you're like, all right. See you later. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah. You, you will get paid for that one job and not engaged again. I, yeah. I always feel like repeat customers are really the, the, the true test. Yeah, when it's been satisfying to get some of those, I mean, it's, you feel good. I mean, you're just like, I did a they good know job. exactly what you deliver, what you charge, and they're back for more. Because yeah. it's a good, you know, you're adding value or whatever, so. Yeah, and I mean, it, honestly, it took us a while, like, at SK, at least, to be able to get repeat customers. And yeah, we're finally at a point where we have a bunch of them. And, it, I mean, it feels really good, right? It's validating. And you're like, yeah. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, not beyond just feeling good. It means you're actually doing a good job. So. Yeah. Well, that's why it feels good. I think. <laughs> yeah, that's true. If you're honest with yourself. You know, you're just like, oh, I, I earned that. Or we earned that yep. as a team. So, yeah. So, um, I guess, what are some of the other features of that buckle that made you decide to to bring a new buckle to market and like you could do better than the oh, status yeah. quo? Yeah. Um. So, so I like, guess I. I started uh, doing, you sort of mentioned soft goods, um, yeah. sort of a niche I stumbled into accidentally um, that turns out not a lot of people do. And then especially- yeah, It's very rare to find soft goods folks. Very production focused and also sort of more on the technical front. So there's a lot of work, there's a lot of soft goods people who do garments, but not so many who do like mass manufacturing or um, like, like, uh, you know, bags, tents, um, spacesuits, you know, more technical applications. Um, not that the, well, the spacesuit though, like, what are you making? Like fucking 20 of them maybe, or like, <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's not really mass manufacturing. That's more yeah. on the like really hard, um, you know, critical requirements from a, a soft goods. Um, yeah. But then also doing soft goods and hard goods um, together. Anyway, so I started doing soft goods a bunch of years ago because I wanted a backpack and I couldn't find what I, you know, one I liked, pretty common story. So I started making them. Yeah. Um, and I'm always kind of pretty interested in like not just the result, but like getting the process right. And so someone offhand mentioned that in production, no one ever uses pins. And so from day one, I just never have used pins in any of my projects. Interesting. Which just means that like, 
you mess up a ton of stuff until you figure out how to do it properly and how to make a proper pattern that goes cool. together right the first time. I mean, you know, it's not going to be dead on. Like, you're still going to make tweaks in terms of the result and the, the I was just at a tailor earlier today, and there were pins in everything. <laughs> well, tailoring, everyone's do, using pins. That's yeah. how you do it. But um, in production, you're not really using pins. And so I, I never did. So anyway, so that sort of started me down a very particular badass. Uh, branch, I guess, of soft goods. And so, yeah, I started doing soft goods. And over the years, designing bags, designing um i worked at a whitewater gear company um for immersion summer. research uh, i probably shouldn't have added them but um yeah, immersion uh, research they make great stuff out of I uniontown pennsylvania summer, um learned a lot um about just pattern making and um you know more there the patterns we're making actually were going into production whitewater rafting uh, skirts right and, and things of that nature uh, yeah kayaking yeah Kayak, sorry um, yeah. Yeah, there's no skirt and rafting. I'm and, and they do like they do a bunch of different things. So anyway, did a lot of soft goods. You had asked about the buckles. Um, and in every project, I'd kind of look at the available hardware. Um, you know, all these buckles and clasps, like all you know the the way you tighten your backpack, the shoulder straps on your backpack, like those clips on the bottom there. Um, just all these different pieces that are sort of essential for making soft goods. Uh, bags particularly or uh, bike packing gear um i was never really happy with what i could find but like if you're doing soft goods you kind of just look at through all the catalogs call a bunch of people get some samples and then go like okay well i don't love any of them but <laughs> we'll use this one and so that's what i was doing for years and every new project it would be the same process where and then at some point i was just like like everyone's doing this. Like I talked to other designers and they're just like, yeah, I found this cool buckle. Like, I don't love these parts about it. And like, no one's just like really just fully thrilled with what's available. Yeah. There's good reasons for that. Right. Like they are really cheap. So like a plastic piece of hardware is anywhere between like, if you're buying thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands of them between 15 and 35 cents, you know, there's some cheaper, there's some more expensive, but just generally that's kind of what you're going to pay for a piece of plastic hardware. And for most people that works fine, but like sometimes you just want the thing you want, right? You're not interested in fine. You just want like for bike packing, I kept breaking buckles <laughs> and, and everyone's just accepted that this is how it is. So there's a piece of, if you're not familiar with bike packing, you basically strap all your gear to a bike and you go typically on like uh, mountain biking trails. So you're cool. off road. And so some of the existing solutions that were out there, um, like bike touring, where you're putting panniers and racks on your bike are not very functional when you're doing like really hard terrain yeah. uh, because the, the bags bounce around or fall off or they get in the way when you have to get off and push your bike or you have to carry your bike or you're crossing rivers. You know, there's different demands on it anyway. The seat post bag, so this bag that attaches to the bottom of your seat. Yeah. Um, if you start riding like a down, you know, downhill sort of bumpy stuff, it will slowly loosen. And so every few minutes you have to get off because it's rubbing on your wheel <laughs> and you tighten it back up. And the tighter you get it, the more stable it is. So the less it's wiggling around and bouncing oh, Jesus. and riding. But if you pull on it too hard because it's plastic, buckles. You're going to crack it. It'll snap. <laughs> <laughs> and so and i was just like this is so annoying and everyone has these issues um and so uh there there is metal hardware out there but the issue is the metal hardware is typically um die cast or punched and the issue with the die cast stuff is because um, also cracks easily you end up with a, yeah it's pretty brittle and so you end up with pretty thick cross sections and so it's heavy so like a, an equivalent of this like die cast firstly they don't make it so small or for three quarter inch webbing which is totally sufficient for that kind of gear they make it in one inch um something an equivalent of this die cast is going to be like 45 to 85 grams this is 8.2 grams nice so a, plastic, a plastic buckle is anywhere from like 3.5 grams to like 26 grams. So yeah. this is right at, you know, it, it's very similar to the weight of plastic and is lighter than a bunch and heavier than a few, but. Well, and everything um, seems to be a weight reduction from what I've seen you at least work on in bikepacking. I mean, 
Like, that seems yeah. to be the big challenge is how do I get the weight down on this as much as possible? Yeah, like, anyone can make a really, really sturdy good bag, but it's hard to get... It's hard to hit the balance right, and you see some people overshoot it where it's super, super light, but also is a bummer to use, isn't that stable, is really annoying to pack, and then actually you only get, you know, maybe a, a season or two of use before it breaks. Um, anyway, so, like, for all those applications where... You actually just want something to work. You, you want it to feel good. You want it to look good. Like there just wasn't really anything on the market. And so, and the reason is cost. So these are expensive to make. Yeah, of course. And so they're expensive to buy. But I think they look nice. Um, other people seem I would to agree. agree. But more importantly, like they function super, super well. They do not slip once you set them because it has a spring loaded gate here. And nice. so the other ones are just relying on friction. Oh, which Jesus. The friction is only generated from tension. Yep. Um, so they, don't, they have no moving parts, which is part of why they're inexpensive. But um, if you are jostling on, you know, going over rocks and bumps and stuff, that jostling creates a little slack. And so it slowly creeps through the buckle. Um, yeah, I'll buy that. Yeah. So anyway, so this one doesn't have that issue. And the breaking... You know, the webbing on these, the webbing tends to break before the buckle and the buckle is just fine. So like, sweet. And it's very funny. We released the three quarter inch first and a bunch of people reached out asking for a one inch, which we have made. Nice. Um, but the, the funny part about it is like, they asked for a one inch cause that's what they use because it's more secure. You know, it's, it's stronger, which is really only an issue if you're using plastic hardware. Cause like if you use our three quarter inch, it is, like, you're not going to be able to, you can't squat what this thing will hold. So, like, <laughs> if it's on your backpack, I can't imagine a scenario where <gasps> your webbing broke, but you could still, like, walk. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, but anyway, I mean, there are applications where one inch makes sense. Um, like, other industries, like, we're going to do a, a heavier-duty one-inch buckle for, like, the overlanding market, which is, like... Oh, uh, cool off-road vehicles yeah they're like badass that. anyway, that's, they're, that's a really cool market just like, i just got really tired of having like just not exactly what i wanted right it's like yeah. ah, it's close in some ways it doesn't quite hit the mark like i can get something that's heavy and strong i can get something that's light but will break i can get something that doesn't have you done any overlanding nice. can i ask or like I, I, I've, I've been wanting to get into overlanding so badly i said have you done any overlanding uh, I used to as a kid. My nice. dad was into it, so we would go out some. Uh, That's yeah, really it was cool. a lot of fun. Uh, lately, I've been more into the, like the bike packing stuff. But I have a cousin with a Tacoma and another friend with a Tacoma that are both into oh, it. Nice. Yeah, those so. are pretty popular. So. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so that, that's kind of it. And then over the years, I've designed a lot of buckles kind of just because I was frustrated with what existed, but never really with an expectation that I'd end up making them. But now that I'm making them, I'm just like going through, dusting them off and kind of refining them for CNC machining. Um, just your old designs. Yeah, so I have a ton of new designs coming up. Nice. Uh, for, what's that? I said you, you're dusting off your old designs for CNC yeah, machining. Yeah, exactly. Nice. So, that's been fun. And then um, some stuff we've been doing on the CNC. So I showed those tombstones. Um, the issue with the tombstones is each new design needs a new tool to be made. So we need to design the tombstone, machine the tombstone. Um, I don't know why they're called tombstones. Maybe because they look a bit like a tombstone. Some anyway, big obelisk That's thing. what I'm talking about. Uh, is, are these tools here, the yeah. fixtures that we're using. Um, so each of those takes a few days to design or more and sometimes has challenges with like tool access where it's hard to get. I mean, for those of you who aren't familiar with CNC's, uh, nice. the inside. So that's a tool changer up there. And then a fourth axis. I don't know if you can quite see that. Um, yeah, yeah, it's in frame now. So that's the fourth axis there. Which pivots this way in order to this orient the part. Plugs in like that and then nice. turns like that. That's cool. Um, and then there's a bunch of tools which you probably can't see because it's a bit dim in there. But anyway, here I, I can sort of here. make out a little bit like. Um... So that's a tool holder. Cool. Um, I guess if you're just listening to this podcast, it's going to kind of not Suck be for as you. amazing. But anyway, so you can imagine if you're oh, trying to get the tool into the part, yeah. at some point you'll hit the other part, you'll hit like hit the tool hit the holder, yeah. 
on one of these parts or on something else. So it takes quite a while to design it so that you can machine all the critical features that you need to get to um, in one setup. And anyway, so it's very time consuming. And the other thing is I mentioned like making eight at a time lets you walk away from the machine for a good amount of time to do something else, which is great. Um, but it's still only about 13 to 17 minutes. Uh... So that's like, and in the meantime, you also need to unload and reload the old tombstone. So realistically, you have like 10 minutes to do something else, which you're still basically just standing at. You're a slave like, to the machine. Not, <laughs> yeah, for constant interruptions, it's pretty hard to get anything else done. So what we're moving to next, which checks a lot of boxes, is you can actually get a gripper, a little set of fingers oh, that nice. go in the tool changer. And... Um, so then we just put blocks of aluminum in the machine and it will go get a new block, put it in the vice, machine it, move it back out. Does that mean you're moving away from the block. tombstones to do that? Yeah, so we're going nice. to get rid of the tombstones and that has a few advantages. One, the big issue, one big issue with the tombstones is as you use them and we're manufacturing hundreds and thousands of parts, as you're, as you're doing that, you're wearing out the tool and so the position of the part shifts and so at some point, it starts to not cut as perfectly. Yeah, and it makes so sense. And so you can, you know, there's some tolerance, right? And if you design your parts well, um, there's a good amount of tolerance for that imprecision. But at some point, you're going to have to make a new tombstone. Um, but I'll, for a ways, be, for a while before that, you're going to live with some, you know, slight issues that maybe aren't problematic. Um, and we really, I mean, we're making a super high-end product, right? So we don't actually want to deal with any of that stuff. Yeah. Um, and so the vice is only going to machine one buckle at a time, which means if there's a tiny imperfection, it's really easy to go address it because it's only nice. happening one time. So instead of having to address it, you know, a little bit, like say you shift a tool path by one thousandth of an inch on this part, but then on the second part, you don't need to shift it. And on the third part, you need to shift it a thou and a half. Oh, you know, God it's damn really it. Really complicated. Yeah. And so you end up not really doing it. And so that, so, so the, the gripper doing one piece at a time, firstly, one single piece flow. So yeah, all the lean people can uh, feel happy about that. Um, <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> um, so single piece flow. But the other big part for us, because we have a lot of parts, a lot of new designs we're trying to do, is it basically reduces the design time. That's what it sounds um, like. I mean, because you don't have to make those tombstones. And so you can put that more into part design, yeah. I would think. So, yeah. So it eliminates the design time on the tombstones, mm -hmm. um, which is going to be great. So I think it's a buzz, though. <laughs> It will allow us to release new products a lot faster. And the other piece is that the prototyping phase right now for us is we make our prototypes. We don't make a tombstone for a prototype because we might change the design. And it makes we sense. do change the design. So we make the prototype one way. And then when we're ready to produce, there's this whole tooling question of how exactly should we produce these? And with the gripper and making one piece at a time, our prototyping will be one step closer to full production. So once we're done prototyping, we're going to be doing it in the same exact way as we're doing production. And obviously when we kick off and we're like, yes, we're happy with the design at that point, we might take some time to refine the tool paths to make them a little bit faster. Um, right. Like you're going to do a little bit more work to get it doing to get it uh, ready for production, but the prototyping and all the effort that goes into the prototyping phase is directly applied to full-scale production. So basically, when we're done with a prototype and we're happy with the result, we just we can right. kick it off. There's no, yeah. yeah. So that's pretty exciting. Um, that's cool. And uh, yeah, should be pretty interesting Im implementing all that stuff. Uh, a lot of like process reliability stuff starts to come into play in a pretty major way. Um, so like just asking other people who have implemented some amount of automation um, in machining, it's easy to get focused on like, uh, uh, you know, how fast can we make each part? But really, if you are comfortable enough that it's not going to have issues, um, you can run the thing overnight. So one thing to look at is how many parts can we make an hour, right? 
But more importantly... Would you need a bar feeder for that, or could you do it with your existing setup? Um, so I have a few phases to implement this. So the first is put the gripper in the tool changer, and then I'm just going to put a tray of parts. So maybe it will hold... At the beginning, it will probably hold you know 20 parts or 50 parts. Yeah. And then it will load those into a pneumatic vise, unload them back into the tray. So that's phase one. Then we take... They just that just machined one side of the buckle. So like this. Top one. So like there's one side machined, but then it still has all this material on the back that needs to be gotten rid of. Yeah. So then manually we will take those parts, flip them over manually into a new tray that has this shape cut into it. Um, and then run the machine again, and it will load them into the vise and machine the back of each part. Cool. So that's phase one. So once we know we can do all that. Um, then there's a question of, can we machine op one in the vise, have the gripper come in, take the part out of the vise, flip it around, and put it back into the vise? That'd be in cool. In a reliable way. And I suspect that the answer is yes, and we've already done some testing of soft jaw design. So like the design of the jaws that grab that part can be designed such that they locate it pretty well just on their own. Nice. And so if we can get it to flip the part from op one to op two, then the third phase, so then we would make a tray that holds blanks, it goes into the vise for op one, it gets flopped, it flipped in the vise for op two, and then the, the gripper would take it out and drop it in a bin or something. Yeah, in the part. right in the garbage. Once that's done, um, the wall of the CNC can be removed. So there's a whole panel that's the side of the machine. That okay, cool. Out. We're gonna make a new panel that has a pneumatic loader. So there will nice. be stacks of aluminum in the side of the machine. Yeah. It'll come down, pick up a block, bring it into the machine, put it in the vise. Then the gripper will come and flip it into the second, you know, from op one to op two. Then the part will be done. And then I'm thinking there's a few options for getting it out of the machine. One is to drive next to a, a vacuum nozzle. So it'll vacuum up the Sweet. part out of the machine. Sweet. And maybe drop it into a bucket of water to keep it from hitting the other parts and damaging them yeah or oil some people do oil ideally we'll avoid oil other options are having the gripper pick it up and bring it over to some chute that carries it out we could use coolant to flush it out of the machine nice all this other stuff um also like if you have chips accumulate in the jaws of the vise if your part comes down and is resting on the shavings of aluminum instead of on the vise directly it can make your part not sit evenly yeah so implementing like air blast also in full-scale production oftentimes cool. people will cut air channels into the vise jaws themselves and then run the air line to the vise jaws so you have direct sexy. air blast yeah, yeah cool. it's all time and effort so i'm thinking at the beginning we're just going to put air nozzles well i'd imagine seat. you probably still get like zones of chips even when you do that like after like right. fucking like you could have 50 this... cycles you probably still get a pile over here it could be i mean this machine so one thing so this is a brother machine um a lot of people are probably familiar with haas machines one one issue that this machine does not really have uh it, it does a very good job at managing chips so chip management um it has uh it flushes coolant down the walls of the machine and oh, cool. gathers all the chips and pushes them out the back. That's awesome. Um, so even if you're doing pretty high material removal, which we're not, like we're making pretty small parts. Like some people are machining like engine blocks. Yeah. Not engine blocks. Our brother like machines? Machine. Mm, yeah, they don't run engine blocks. That's incorrect. More like um, a transmission case, right? So they're machining yeah. the whole flange. Uh, so some larger components that you're going to have a lot more shavings flying off. Um, so anyway, so yeah, so that's some stuff I'm working on that's pretty interesting, pretty fun to think about. Yeah, it's a lot about like G-code and like which, where do you store your parameters for each part so that you can write sub programs that are called that do like loading the vice. Um, is going to be a sub program to where it goes and gets a new part and brings it into the vice. But I want to write it in such a way that my master program that called that program passes all the parameters so that I don't need to have a bunch of those sub programs for e that are specific for each component that we machine. Makes sense. That I'll just have 
one program for each component. Yeah, and then based on the parameters you pass, that's how it exactly. knows what to handle, yeah, so, or how to handle it. So that's sort of the goal. It's pretty pretty interesting. Um, yeah. So then I'm I'm sort of talking, and this is something I wanted to bounce off you. Yeah, I'm, point, I'm but, Thinking about taking a cheap desktop like CNC router um, and putting a paint nozzle on it and having to paint the parts. You're not the so first person that's come to me with this. <laughs> yeah, so there's a, I can buy off the shelf a robotic arm with a paint gun on it and pretty good interface and so on and so forth. You know, I'm probably in 50 grand easy. ABB or uh, something. Yeah, and I just suspect that it's more than I need. Because yeah. if you think about it, like, I don't actually need precision. There's no cutting forces, right? So, like, one of those belt-driven crappy desktop CNC routers. Not to say you can't do cool things with them, but they're not very rigid. Be correct. So that would be fine. Yeah. Right? So like say I buy one of those for like five hundred dollars or whatever, put a fourth axis on it to turn the part. Yeah. I feel like and then I think I could just handwrite the programs. So open loop same every time. You're probably fine, yeah, I would think. Right? Yeah, I mean, especially because that way you don't have any sensors to worry about getting jammed up because, you know, it's just, it's not sensing. It's just doing the thing every time. Right, it's just doing a thing. Maybe, I mean, you probably you need might, some over... Do you think clog would be an issue? So, like, if you if your lines get too clogged and then it starts to clump up and your spray gets shitty, yeah. that would dick you over? Because I, I feel like I that's the one thing to watch out for. Like, if you flushed acetone, like you were talking about, maybe that's the way around it. Right. I mean, they're pretty like with with any particular coding, I think you would definitely need to get the applicator to be reliable, but they make pretty like I have a pretty good spray gun. At the beginning when I started doing the the paint in-house, um I just bought like a cheap uh, of course. airbrush cuz you want to see <laughs> if it like, works. It was like it was like $20. <laughs> and I'm like I'm doing it and I'm painting and I was talking to a buddy of mine who does, who's done a lot more paint and he was like, Oh, how's it going with the paint? And I was like, you know, it's going well, but like, it takes me like 10 minutes to paint each part. He's like, what? <laughs> Whoa, what? Uh, buy this spray gun um, and do it this way and you'll be all set. And so I, I spent, you know, $350 on a spray gun. Yeah. And night and day. It's <laughs> <laughs> like you get what you pay for. That's um, so true. Yeah. Not always. I feel like like we talked yeah. about earlier, there are charlatans that'll abuse that principle. And so yeah, sometimes, right. yeah, you'll pay a ton of money, and you'll get like the same quality as like a good one already. Or like worse, like you'll spend a ton of money and get a shitty quality, but it looks nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there def that definitely exists. But this thing like the atomization is super even, so you don't get like weird, like the other one, every now and then would like spatter out some droplets and oh God. ruin your part, and you'd have to just like take all the <laughs> paint off and then restart. It doesn't ever um, clump up, like even like repeated use and stuff, or? Um, so no, so actually I was having an issue until yesterday when I called the people who make the coding and I was describing one issue I was having where on some of the parts, and this one doesn't have it, but there would be well, looked like a little bit of dust landed on it, but it didn't. I didn't think it was dust because I'm pretty careful about where I'm painting. Yeah, and then also it was the same color, so it looked like it was the coating. Oh, and weird. Apparently, and I'm new to paint, so anyone who's done a bunch of paint knows. You know, this is nothing new, probably. But when you're when you're spraying, and I knew this part when you're spraying, the the trigger has two two stages. One just starts the air in the gun and then the second one is where you start to release paint into the stream. so i was spraying every time i stopped a pass i'd fully release the trigger so apparently every time you do that a little bit of paint can accumulate on the end of the gun and then sort of start building up and then at some point it'll break off and fly out and they're tiny little particles right but still an issue and has a it's a blemish yeah um, so what you're meant to do is the whole time you're painting is you're holding in that first stage. So the air is always flowing. 
Yeah. And then every pass, you're just reintroducing the paint into the airstream. And so none of the paint accumulates on the tip there. That makes sense. That, that has solved that problem. Today nice. I just did a batch of paint. So it's almost it like welding paint. a little bit with the shielding gas. Yeah, you have like, yeah, exactly. Because you have like a purge after the weld stops of like five seconds. And this is the same way. Like, so you keep the air flowing for a bit after you're done and then put the gun down and that makes sure it doesn't start accumulating. Um, and actually, I noticed when I cleaned the gun at the end of the paint that um, when I cleaned the paint gun, the the nozzle was a lot cleaner. I did notice, so that nice. solved some problems. But that's yeah, all, even one, at the end of shift. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the the one issue. I would have thought like all that stuff just jizzes out at the end. <laughs> if you wait, that sounds like yeah. it's the opposite. Like you're just treating it right, so it treats you right. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so that was a win. Um, the the one thing I'm realizing long term is I'm doing using this coating partly because I can do it in house, so I can control the whole process. It has really nice colors, which I like a lot. Yeah. Now you were using Cerakote. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't probably yeah. say what your coating. No, is. no, using Cerakote. Um, yeah. and it, it's. It's a great coating mechanically, corrosion resistance, all this stuff, UV resistance, but it is labor intensive to apply as compared to a process where you're just racking them up and then moving the whole rack from tank to tank, like anodize. Yeah. And anodize is also a good coating. So at some point, I'm going to probably release some of these that are just anodized. Um, yeah, makes sense. Way, um, you know, just uh, long term. savings on the customer, I would think. Yeah, exactly. And the other issue with this is as I increase production, I'm just realizing like, I'm pretty like at this point, I'm relatively good at picking up new hand skills, I feel like because I've worked in a shop a bunch. And even the and even with that, it's still taken me quite a bit of time to get good at paint where I'm not creating a bunch of rejects. <laughs> And so just imagining like hiring for that, like, yes, you can get lucky and find someone God who damn. has a bunch of years of experience in paint, but around here, I'm just like, oh man, that's going to be hard to find. I, I feel well, like. Well, I mean, so. I've talked to you about shops in your area that can't find talent to run their, their stuff. Yeah, <laughs> so. right. Exactly. So it I mean, near me know, too. sort of where automation, either automation or um switching processes or um, most likely uh both i i do really want to keep it all in the house though uh just because you see like a lot of these lower value add processes like if you think about it if i send a hundred or a thousand buckles to an anodizer they're charging me i don't know what per but not a ton of money per piece if they mess up, right? Like they don't care a ton because you're not paying them enough to really care. Yeah, yeah that's so true. Like, and if they scrap a batch, so, they're like, oh, sorry. It yeah, sucks to be not, you now. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of inventory, a lot of cost <laughs> to me. So I don't know. I, so I've also been thinking about maybe doing anodize in house. Nice. Um, and like, because it's just intervals in different tanks, uh, again, like. Single piece that, might actually be doable. Totally. And I just feel like I could automate it. Yeah, um, I'll help you out if you want. I mean, yeah. if you think there's a place for me there. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's kind of what I'm working on. It's pretty, pretty fun. The Kanban stuff is really fun to implement. It's so badass. That was really, a game changer for me. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's such a relief. <laughs> you know, you don't realize how much mental energy you're exerting just like tracking all this stuff and oh shit we ran out then you're overnighting replacements and that costs <laughs> money. so yeah that, yeah and then just shop improvements so one of the things with uh is like constant the idea of constantly improving your shop um to eliminate waste and i found it to be really fun because sometimes like making the same thing over and over is gets to be a bit monotonous um but if really what you're working on is not the thing but the process that makes that then there's constantly room for improvement and you're always yeah. thinking like about new challenges and new problems and so yeah yeah just trying to like do things that improve the speed and efficiency and reduce rejects and all this stuff has been uh really interesting and fun 
And also just feels like the type of thing where at some point I'm going to get, you know, quite good at doing it here. And maybe at some point I'll help other shops. Um, yeah. Implement that kind of thing. So I'm sure you'd yeah. be really good when at we it. We were doing the face shield stuff. Um, so at the beginning of the pandemic, um, you know, when PPE was in short supply, there were a bunch of 3D, we've discussed this, but a bunch of 3D. March, April, 2020. Out there. Uh, and I was like, oh, cool. Like, yeah, that'd be great to help. I have a 3D printer. So I printed one and it took 25 minutes. <laughs> and these hospitals, you know, they needed like 10,000 a day. They didn't need one, right? Yeah. So I was just like, this does not seem like the answer. So yeah, designed a new one with some friends um, that was all laser cut. Or... We made like 700 of your design. What's that? <laughs> Said my, my guys made 700 of your design. Yeah, like pretty fast. Yeah. 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 Um, so it was just fast to make and it was all really all optimized for production um, on all sorts of tools. So vinyl cutters could run it, CNC routers, laser cutters, die cutters. Um, anyway, we ramped up, we made um, a few hundred thousand units, but then also open sourced the design. And I think somewhere between like a million and a half and like two and a half million got made, apparently. Yeah, and I mean, certain track the exact numbers, but you, you've kind of corrected me on this. I, I was going to say you broke McMaster car. You were like, well, everybody broke McMaster car then, but there were like thicknesses <laughs> yeah. of plastic you couldn't buy. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's kind of crazy. Elastic was really hard to find. We screwed up and we um, got like 16th inch polycarbonate for some of them which was way too thick <laughs> so oh, it just yeah, it's like looked ridiculous yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> didn't mean yeah. ANSI um, at all <laughs> so anyway in doing that um we had a few factories running them where they were about to kind of lay off their people and then we were like hey now bring them back let's start cranking these out and we videoed the assembly process and between rev one and rev two basically did like motion studies um, there's a cool, there's a couple in the 50s that did a lot of work in motion studies. The uh, Gerbreth was their last name, I think. Gerbreth. So they came up with Thurblig analysis, um, which is pretty cool. They It's like 27, I think it's 27 symbols of different parts of a person moving. Interesting. And so like searching with your eyes has has a symbol. Like transporting your hand empty, transporting your hand full. Um, just like every little bit of what someone might it's be doing in completing a task. And so we went through the video and just mapped the whole thing out. And you just start to see like these huge inefficiencies. And so we redesigned the thing. And between Rev 1 and Rev 2, I think we cut 30% of assembly time out. Nice. And it, yeah, so anyway, so that was fun and interesting. And I don't know, so all the motion study stuff and like ergonomics and fun but yeah it's where all the stuff starts coming together so keeps 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 life interesting that's badass yeah cool it's pretty fun well, yeah is there anything else you want to plug or like or uh, you know kind of tell people about uh, while we're still doing this sure yeah i mean i guess definitely check us out on instagram um austere, austere, austere man manufacturing yep um on instagram have a website austere manufacturing.com if you want um, high performance hardware or you know you need better hardware, um, yeah, let me know. Uh, reach out. Um, and then also, I do some consulting as well. So, very good at it, I might add. Technical and um, what's that? So, you're very good at it, I might add. Oh, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, anyway, yeah, reach out. Love working on new product projects and even uh, also just to talk through ideas, you know, if it's not, if you just want uh, some ideas. And then also please reach out anyone who can answer some of my questions about lean. I'd love to talk to someone who has implemented it, who's been in the trenches and uh, maybe has some some information on how to think about batch yeah. sizes, any tricks of doing like coatings or paint or really more broadly, just anything where you have a long cycle time. Like when I bake them in the oven for two and a half hours, like do I need a tunnel oven or do I just leave it and just hang one piece and set a timer for each piece in the oven. Anyway, all these questions. Interesting. Um, yeah. 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 That's that's about it on my end. That's cool. Well, hey, Ariel, thanks for coming on. I'm gonna I'm gonna cut it just so yeah. I can get some dinner in me. <laughs> but, uh, awesome. It's been really fun. Thanks for having me on. We've been trying to do this so long. Uh, we should do it again. I would like to have yeah. you as a recurring guest. 
Yeah, and, we have uh, a ton of other stuff I feel like we didn't talk about that we talked about talking about. We'll, so. we'll set another one up like before we I'm call sure it. I'm we'll sure we'll have plenty of other episodes in us. Um, great. Well, have a good night. Sweet. You too. And uh, praise Allah. If you've stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button. Or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. We're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.